cloud. Okay, so here we are. We're starting the uh, uh, last Friday of the month Pacific Planetarium seminar. Uh, it's always at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time on the last Friday of the month. Uh, and this week we have uh, Julie Stopar from the Lunar and Planetary Institute, and uh, she's going to talk to us about moon, the moon in particular. So uh, I think without further delay, Julie. Okay. Uh, let's see, get this sharing screen on here. We have your desktop showing. Okay. Perfect. Slides up. All right. So thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I am actually also a co-investigator on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter CAM team, or LROC for short. Um, so today I thought I would share with you some of the new images that we've acquired and some of the new great views that we've um, taken particularly of um, some volcanic landforms. Um, and these are images that we've taken with our camera system, which is on board the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, or LRO spacecraft for short. And so the LRO spacecraft was launched in um, June of 2009, and um, it was actually launched together with the LCROSS spacecraft. Um, in the images here, they're both located inside this tailored fairing and they were separated after launch. Uh, the primary mission of LRO is to conduct investigations that will someday enable a human return to the moon. Um, but as part of that, we also get a lot of great science too. And so um, our first year in orbit at the moon, we were in a 50 kilometer altitude polar orbit, which means that the spacecraft passes over the north and south poles. Um, it's also the lowest that a spacecraft has consistently orbited the moon. Uh, but right now we're actually in more of an elliptical orbit. Um, it's uh, 30 kilometers altitude at the south pole and 155 kilometers at the north pole. Uh, and there were, or there are seven instruments on the spacecraft, and they collect a variety of different types of data. Um, so there's crater up here, which is a radiation detector. This is the binary, which is a thermal imager. Um, this is Mini RF, and this is the spacecraft before it was launched. It's, so it's sitting in the Goddard uh, Space Flight Facility um, near the solar panels back here in um, the dark area here. Um, so this is MIRF, which was a, uh, is a um, radar experiment. Um, there's LOLA, which is a laser altimeter, which gives us uh, elevation information. Uh, there's LAMP, which is a far UV detector. Uh, LEN, which is a neutron detector. And then, of course, there's LROC, which um, has a wide-angle camera, or WAC, and two narrow-angle cameras, which are basically small telescopes. Hey, Julie. Yeah. Uh, could you flip it back just for a second? Um, do you mind uh, questions in the middle if you... If... Oh, we can do that if you like it that way. It's all right. I, I, actually, it's more of a comment than a question. The okay. left-hand image is really neat. I really like that image, which, which shows infrared, ultraviolet, yeah. radar, all those different things, and an, Im, and an actual image showing what that kind of uh, data looks like when displayed. Yeah. Um, so, yes. yeah, this is like, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's not exactly data to dome, but on a, actually in another, it could well be data to dome. There's this program uh, that we call data to dome. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's I like that image too. I, I think it's really great. Um, these are all the different ways that we can kind of visualize the surface as well as, um, you know, you can see how some have strengths and others have weaknesses in some areas, like so the Illumination, we have uh, some shadows at the poles, but then in other data sets like elevation or uh, UV, that you don't have the same problem. So I think it's just a nice way to show how each data set is complementary. Okay, so the, for, the, for the planetarium people listening, I just imagined those words flipped so that they were above 
or it, it, the mirror image uh, so that it would be a horizon text. That would be really cool as a full dome image. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so just the, so from the LROC instrument, you know, we're getting new data all the time. Um, this is our wide angle camera wheel looks like. And the mirror angle cameras. And so from the wide angle camera, what we do is we are continuously imaging the moon um, while we're in orbit um, and on the illuminated side anyway. And um, we use that to stitch all those images together and we make up these global views like this one. Um, and then the narrow angle camera gives us the high resolution detail. So we get up to uh, half a meter per pixel or 20 inch uh, resolution of the surface. And over here is the Apollo 11 landing site. Um, and you can see that that's, that resolution is pretty great. You can make out the, the lunar lander, which is still on the surface, some of the hardware they left behind, um, as well as the astronauts' tracks um, on the surface. Um, the other thing that we can do with the NAC is if we tell the spacecraft to roll, uh, we can actually look at the horizon um, or the limb of the moon. And then we get these uh, perspective views, which give us a, a broader view of the morphology of the surface. And um, in addition, all the images that we collect from both the left and the neck, um, portions of those can actually be used to derive topography of the surface and tell us even more about the shape of different landforms. Uh, so I think this crowd at least should know um, generally that the moon is a world of both volcanic eruptions and impact craters, and that there are two basic terrains of the heavily cratered highlands and the dark maria. No surprises there, I'm sure. Um, and then the moon's near side is marked by great expanses of volcanic lavas. But the one thing that it's not always um, so readily known is that there's actually color on the moon. And some of the lavas are pure blue, while others appear more red. And um, the astronauts actually noticed that when they were flying over the lunar surface and they um, called it out to the ground crew. Uh, and they would identify certain um, areas as looking blue or uh, reddish or even yellow. Um, we also have uh, pieces of some of the lunar lava flows. Um, many of the rocks that were brought back by the Apollo uh, missions um, are pieces of basalt, which is a volcanic rock type that makes up lava flows as well as the lunar maria. And then I thought I would just go over a few basic um, uh, details about volcanoes in general. Um, you may be familiar with the ones on Earth. Um, basically, a volcano is a cone construct that's built up of layers of lava flows. And then um, the eruptions are actually uh, from uh, magma that is a uh, liquid silicate in the Earth's interior. Um, on the Earth, it's usually stored in a magma chamber near the surface. And then that um, rises to a conduit to the main vent where the eruption occurs. And you get lava flows as well as pyroclastic thick ash typically. Well, interestingly, the process is pretty similar on the moon uh, with a, a couple of key differences. Uh, one of those being that we think that the magma is actually sourced much deeper in the moon's interior, um, even relatively speaking, than the Earth. So we think it comes from about 100, up to 100 kilometers depth. Um, at the um, boundary between the crust and mantle. And the other um, difference is that we usually call the conduit through which the magma rises, we call that a dike. Um, just a little terminology. Um, and so on the moon, there's a range of lunar volcanic eruption types that are reflected in uh, the uh, morphology of the volcanoes. And the key factors in these different types of eruptions are um, the content of volatiles as well as how the volatiles behave during the eruption. Uh, there's uh, the volume of the material that's erupted, how fast that is um, being erupted or rising to the surface, 
the temperature of the magma as well as the viscosity of the magma, and that is basically the magma's resistance to flow. But in general, there is a rule of thumb that you can just keep in mind that more gas in the magma typically means a more explosive eruption. So here's a couple examples of different um, end numbers. So in this case, if the magma is rising and um, at some depth uh, uh, beneath the surface, uh, bubbles, uh, bubbles start to form as the gases come out of the liquid phase and it separates from the liquid part of the magma. And this is called an exposition depth. And different gases evolve at different depths of pressures. So for example, carbon monoxide is much deeper than um, the depth at which water comes out into the magma. Um, but as it's rising, if these bubbles are, are kept relatively well suspended in the flow and they don't coalesce, um, this might happen if there's a relatively low content of gas in the magma, or if the magma rises very fast, or another possibility is that the magma is actually too viscous that the bubbles can't really escape from it, so they're trapped in the flow as it's rising. Um, and in, the, in these cases, the uh, gases rise to the surface and um, they don't have a lot of explosive energy to them. They, um, they diffuse calmly, and so you end up with active lava flows and effusive eruptions, but not a lot of pyroclastics um, and fragmented debris. But on the other end, uh, as the magma is rising, if these bubbles are rising faster than the magma, they tend to get bottled up and then they form gas pockets. And so these are sometimes called gas slugs, but they're basically large pockets of gas. And then when those hit the lunar surface and they encounter the vacuum of space, they decompress extremely fast and rapidly and it's very explosive. We get a lot of pyroclastics and debris in this situation. Um, and so basically all of the different types of um, volcanic landforms that we see on the moon actually reflect these two major processes. So the behavior of the gases and um, how the liquid magma is rising. So on the one end, you get mare plains, which are extensive, um, low viscosity flows to spread out very broadly across the surface, um, low explosive behavior. Uh, sometimes that rising magma will encounter uh, a topographic feature like a pre-existing impact crater. Um, it can intrude into the bottom of that impact crater, but it also deposits um, mare material in there frequently. Um, a sort of intermediate case is where the volume of the eruption is less. Um, so in this case, you get relatively short lava flows. Um, they build up relatively small volcanic shields and domes rather than the very broad um, mare plains. And then as the eruptions get more explosive, you get these gas pockets starting to form. Um, you get these intermittent explosive eruptions, and those form pyroclastic cones. This is a lot like the cinder cones that you see in Hawaii and Italy and Arizona and Mexico and a lot of places. They're really common on the Earth. Um, and then as you get to even more explosive behaviors, you get a lot of broadly dispersed pyroclastics and gas and debris. And this spreads out into a large blanket of pyroclastic materials that we have the term for called dark mandolin deposits or DMDs for short. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is there's all this stuff going on at the surface, but for all that you see at the surface, there are many more intrusions of magma that don't make it to the surface and they fall out in the uh, lunar crust. Okay, so now to get to the fun part of looking at some of these features with new images from orbit. Okay, so first uh, take a look at the Mare Plains here. Um, this is a very prominent example of a Mare flow that's in Mare Imbrium. And you can see the edges of this flow are really well preserved and um, they're very um, uh, distinct here in the low sun image. And you can also see that they resemble 
in general, the outline that lava flows, basaltic lava flows in Hawaii made, um, even though they're at very different scales. So this Hawaiian flow is a couple hundred meters in length, and these are um, many, many kilometers in length. And so the Mara flows are constructed of these large expansive, but also very thin flows of about one to 10 meters thick on average. And one of the cool things about uh, Mari flows is um, they have these collapse pits in some cases and skylights, another term for the same feature. Um, these are collapse pits. This is an example in Mari Imbrium um, where there's, there's a very steep and deep crater here. It doesn't look like an impact crater at all. Um, you look at it from the side to the east and then to the west here. Um, in the walls of this crater, you can see very steep sheer drop, many layers of lava exposed in here. And um, in this one over here, when you look to the west, there's a shattered area, which is um, indicates that there's actually a cave under here. Um, and so that's part of the reason why these are of interest because this would be a really interesting place to go explore. Um, we don't really know what to expect down there. Um, but the, one of these pits in the Marius Hills was discovered by um, the Tiberius Lean team. And then since its discovery, we went and looked at um, all the Im images we got from Elrock and we actually found several more um, examples of these pits in the Mari that hadn't been found yet. Uh, and so then looking at the large scale features, there are um, large volcanic shields on the moon, many, um, a hun several hundred kilometers in diameter. And um, they're made up of many lava flows. And um, this is an example of one where we're looking across it, out across the surface at it. And this here, this uh, semi-circular area is um, what we call the Hibernus caldera. And we think this is the central vent on top of a large volcanic shield. And then this dark area shows some of the debris that's been um, uh, ejected from that vent. Um, it's actually hard to see the structure of this feature because it's so big. Um, it's so broad and so big that you can't really make out a cone shape here. And that's partly because the materials were just spread out so far and wide that it didn't really build up the top structure. And then there are some examples of smaller shield volcanoes. Here's a cluster of um, several of these in the Hortensius region. And these are about 10 to 30 kilometers in diameter. And then here this image is looking out across uh, obliquely at them again. And I've outlined a few of them here in white. And there's three examples. And then each has the central crater, which we think was the central vent for the eruption. And then uh, here are the dark mantle deposits um, that I was mentioning. And they actually come in two different flavors. So there's a regional dark mantle deposit, which is basically a broad blanket of pyroclastic materials. And they're called dark mantling deposits because they're usually a pure dark to your eye. They're made up of glass beads. Um, and so it appears dark. This is a well-known example that was um, discovered during the Tower 17 with the Taurus Litro Valley. You can see that the whole deposit is much bigger than just that area. And this area is about 75 kilometers across. Um, but then there are these other ones, which we call localized deposits. And these are um, often just a few kilometers in dimension. And um, this is an example here where the dark area is uh, pyroclastic around this vent. It's, a, it's, it's basically a small, low, um, low broad cone, but nowhere near the extent and um, dispersion that you get at the regional ones. And these smaller ones, they usually occur um, inside older impact craters that have been intruded by the Mari. And um, these were known uh, for many years, but 
thanks to the new data that we've been getting, we actually found a number of new examples of these that nobody had previously recognized. And then we get to the even smaller scale. Um, we're looking at the small cinder spatter cones. Um, these are one or two kilometers in diameter. They have a vent. And then the sides of them are um, made up of pyroclastics that are deposited very close to the vent, so things like cinder and spatter, which are terms for different kinds of pyroclastics. Um, and then in many cases, they also have these relatively short lava flows associated with them. So this one here is about 10 kilometers in length. And um, these were actually known um, before they decided where to send the Apollo missions. Um, we knew that they occurred in the Marius Hills, there were a lot of them there. Um, and they actually wanted to send one of the Apollo missions there, but it didn't quite happen. Um, but since then, we got this new imagery, and uh, we've been able to find more of them in other places on the moon. But now we can also make out the details of these. You can see um, in, in some of the details, like layers in the cones, as well as these uh, the structure of the lava flows associated with them. So that's really pretty cool and exciting. And so one of the things that I did um, as part of the mission was to actually map out the distribution of these features. And so this is a map of the Lunar side. And each of these colors um, just represents different shapes of these cinder cones. So some were very symmetric and others were elongated. Um, but overall, uh, just look at the distribution. So you can see that right away they are clustering in two main areas. So the first cluster is the Mayas Hills. Um, and there's also another one in the Hortensius, Copias, Meyer region. And um, it turns out that both of these areas are areas that have a um, low volcanic shield um, in them. And um, so what we found was that looking at the distribution of these cones in um, reference to the other volcanic deposits, was that the cones are late stage eruptions that occur on top of a sequence of older flows in these areas. And one of the things that we noticed was that um, there's no central vent on the structure, which is in contrast to what you see in a lot of um, terrestrial volcanoes. A lot of them will have a central vent or caldera, as we like to call it. Um, and this is where um, the volcanic eruptions tend to be centered. Um, you can get some um, eruptions on the flanks of the volcanoes, like particularly Hawaii, that happens a lot. So you have these rift zones where magma gets diverted to the flanks of the volcano. Um, but in the case of the lunar um, volcanic shields, we aren't seeing that kind of structure. And so I like to call them volcanic shields rather than shield volcanoes, just to kind of make that differentiation. And the other thing that we um, concluded is that there had to be a lot of different source sites um, in order to actually create all of these different deposits that we were seeing. And that there were probably large areas of intrusions beneath the structure itself where magma got trapped. Um, and then another question that a lot of people find interesting, myself included, is um, when did the last volcanic eruption on the moon occur? So looking at the volcanic plains on the moon, we've uh, dated them using um, the sizes and frequencies of craters that are superposed on them. So basically, younger features have less craters, and they certainly don't have any large craters. Um, using this technique, we determined that um, well, scientists, not just us on the LR team, but uh, leader scientists in general, had determined that uh, the last Mari eruption occurred somewhere between 1.2 billion years ago and 900 million years ago. Um, and this is an example um, of a crater wall um, in the Maria. And as you can see, exposed in the wall of this crater, there's layers upon layers upon layers of Mari material. And each one of these horizons is about you know, one to 10 um, meters. In, so individually, as you can see, there's quite a sequence of events here. 
Um, but there's also, in addition to these lava flows, there are some fresher looking landforms in the Maria that we're trying to understand right now uh, because they may suggest even younger eruptions potentially occurring within the last hundred million years. So, you know, as recently as the time of the dinosaurs, which for the moon is pretty young. Um, and so these features are nicknamed irregular Mari patches or imps for short. Uh, there are these very conspicuous looking deposits that don't look like the Mari around them at all. Um, they have smooth mounds in them, this example right here. And um, these are interspersed by this lower, uneven looking material. Um, this has a very um, crenulated or hummocky appearance, much like many lava flows on the Earth, if you, when you look at it in great detail. Um, and then there are also these blocky, bright areas along the margins of these deposits. And um, most of those are also associated with extremely steep slopes. So greater than 40 degree slopes. Uh, so they're very steep. They're keeping the surfaces there fresh. There's lots of blocks eroding out of them. Uh, the imps themselves um, also often occur in volcanic areas. So this one occurs inside a volcanic pit. Um, it's part of this volcanic um, graben terrain. I'm not exactly sure what happened here, but it's kind of cross-cut by another tectonic feature. This is clearly an area that was very active at some point in the past, both volcanically and tectonically. Um, the question though is when did this uh, deposit get in place here? Did this happen at the same time or is this much longer? And so there's a classic example of these that's been known since Apollo 15. Um, and it was called Ina. And it's this irregular looking D-shaped landform. It has lots of these little smooth mounds in it and the rough uneven looking material between it. And um, since then though, with the LRA data, we've found more than 70 other examples of these landforms. Uh, this map here shows there are locations so around the near side. They all occur in the Maria and um, they have a range of morphology. Some look a lot like Ina, like this one, although Ina is a little bit unique in that it, it occurs in what we think is also a volcanic caldera. And most of the other ones don't. They um, don't seem to be that well confined to a volcanic vent. But this one um, shown here on the right uh, does seem to have a, a little bit of a topographic environment, but most of it um, does not. And so we're trying to understand what that means for their formation. The other cool thing about this one, it actually has a little dome in the center, which we think might be an area where some of the eruptions were centered. But then there are even other weirder examples like this one down here, which looks more like a string of pits and craters. The smooth mounds aren't as obvious. Um, you think they're still there, but they don't have the same distinct boundaries. And so we're trying to understand what these mean for the volcanic history of the moon. Uh, the fact that they don't have very many impact craters on them and that they have such great detail well preserved really implies that they have to be young. Um, but the question is, how does that fit in with what we know about the volcanism and how the moon is cool? So the reason why that's important is because um, as the moon has cooled over time, the, the crust of the moon itself is cooling and getting thicker and thicker. So not only is there less heat available to make magma to rough its surface, but it also gets harder and harder for it to get to this cooling and thickening crust. And so over time, volcanism gets less and less common on planets as they cool. And from mapping out the mare and their volumes, um, this histogram here shows that um, basically, in the past, around 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago, most of the volcanic eruptions on the moon occurred at that time. And then that gradually, or actually pretty steeply dropped off, and then gradually trickled out until um, about 1 billion years ago. 
and then we thought it ended. So the big question is, are ants telling us something that is even younger than that, or is something else going on that we don't fully understand yet? And then the other interesting thing is um, the really old volcanism. Um, another area where people are very interested in working on because um, understanding the early uh, volcanism is equally important to understanding how uh, the moon's interior is structured. And so the reason why it's difficult to study these older deposits is because, um, because they're so old, basically, they've had a lot of time to become degraded or buried by younger materials. And so I think we've lost some of this history, unfortunately, um, but other parts of it are probably buried under younger materials, waiting for us to find a way to uh, study it. And then um, I will just close by saying, the moon is close, interesting, and useful. And um, I've had fun studying it. And I hope you enjoy looking at it too in the night sky. So now I can take some questions. I've got a question about the the pits. Sure. Um, how old are those? Do, were those did those happen fairly? Um, uh, hold on one second, Josh. Yeah. Is that Josh? No, Andy. 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 Um, I want to stop the recording and restart okay. it so that. You